And if yep. someone could be that sweaty about my casual <laughs> board game, maybe do maybe not, maybe uh, don't do that. Do not <laughs> underestimate the sweat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Destruction makers. Variance is something that is massively misunderstood in game design. Uh, most people think it's just randomness. Um, there's. I, I do think that we should probably clarify the difference. There's that, a like, difference between variance, variance and randomness, and randomness yes. because even I get hung up on it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, variance is or randomness is part of variance. Um, that is one type of variance. Uh, but there are different types of variance, and using them in different ways uh, can make your game feel much different. Yes. Uh, we're going to talk about variance as defined by Greg Kostikian. 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 Yes. yes. Who wrote a book called Uncertainty uh, in Games. Uncertainty in Games? Yes. Um, okay. So he defines the four categories of variance as hidden information, skill, opponent, and randomizers. So like I said, random is one part of variance. Uh, something that Richard Garfield describes uh, in his book uh, characteristics of games is that chess is not a game that has zero variance as right. what some people sort of describe chess in that way, but it has one thing, that one creates layer of variance. one layer of variance, which is that you are playing against someone else. Right. Uh, and without that, it wouldn't be a game. Right. right. Isn't that the, the, de the definition is that games need some kind of uncertainty. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it's not a game, right? That is a definition of. So let's go through these these uh, different types of variants, and we'll just sort of give a brief overview in how you might be able to utilize some of these things within your game. Yeah. Um, so h hidden information is something that I think doesn't get thought about enough while you're designing a game. I think this yeah. just came up like not that long ago with some, with one of the things that you were working on, hmm. in that yeah. um, you you. Uh, when when something becomes uh, revealed information and then becomes hidden information again, you're it's it's very taxing on like the the players like mental upkeep in terms of like needing to remember all yeah. of these different. Suddenly things. now there's a skill involved in memorization, which yeah, isn't yeah. exactly like the most interesting skill. Right. It's yes. not one that's expected in most games, at least. Right. When I've heard it, the uh, memorization described as like the same thing as like Twitch skills and playing like a first person mm. shooter or something in that it's a test of like physical skill right. and not uh, like mental skill right. or, or strategy. Right. Um, and so this, this is something that I try to look for a lot when I'm designing games is that am I asking a player to memorize things and hold too much information in your head when I want the decisions being made to be much more about heuristics, right? Like, right. like common practices and you having developed this like uh, sort of like best practice of being in this situation. You, you're not memorizing the situation that you're in. You are um, remembering similar situations and, and able to determine whether or not the thing that you are doing is the right thing to do based on your experience, right. not on having memorized, oh, I remember this is the position of these things on the board, therefore I should do this. Right. And I think that a, like, a good reminder, I feel like at least I give this as a reminder to myself when I think of like high-level magic play or high-level mm -hmm. TCG play is yep. that they all have something to write with usually, yep. and they'll write down any card that they know their opponent has but yep. has not played and that's that's one way to sort of hedge against this type of variance right? right is that okay well this information that was once hit once hidden has been revealed and that's something that i should take note of because it gives me an edge right and yeah. if someone could be that sweaty about my casual board game <laughs> maybe do maybe not, maybe um, don't do that do not <laughs> underestimate the sweat <laughs> yeah i'm sure the sweat is very real oh i know um so uh Information management, I think, is where this sort of variance comes from in that um, you can allude to some things that might be true. This gives a, like a really good opportunity for players to be able to bluff, right? Mm -hmm. Is that if you have hid, uh, uh, hidden information and you have imperfect information that has been revealed, this is the famous two untapped blue mana in yep. Magic, um, that gives players the opportunity to use that hidden information as a skill to their advantage to to uh, help give them an edge. I actually think that this is this is what most people talk about when they criticize other trading card games. 
that uh, use sort of a volley-like system, like Hearthstone, Digimon does this, where there's not a lot of cross-interaction. There's no, I activate my card in response to yours, like Magic has. Um, and I think a lot of people end up missing what's really great about that system is not the fact that you can play a card, but it's the fact that you could threaten that you have something yep. because that is so much more powerful. Um, the only other TCG that I think that does this really well is actually Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, Yu-Gi-Oh having set trap cards mm -hmm. has players rethinking, especially old school Yu-Gi-Oh. Just any, like you said, any of that sort of, uh, someone knows that you have something that you could do that could alter their plans, but you don't know what that information is right. does change the game pretty dramatically right another way to look at this too is something like poker right like if you're playing texas hold'em meaning you get two cards that are face down and then there's uh five cards in the middle of the table face up and that you're making your hand of cards based on that yeah information you're placing bets and things with imperfect information you don't know what two cards are face down right you know what all the cards are that are face up and you know what your cards are but then we get to this you know the bluffing and right right um so the next type of variance uh is skill yes um and i think that this probably has to do somewhat with also like choice variance uh and heuristics that i you know i brought up earlier is that um one your your level of skill is part of this variant this type of variance but it's also about uh understanding what choices to make when right and yeah. heuristics are is essentially a fancy word for best practices in terms of um the situations that you are in are so complicated. There's no way to have memorized the exact game state. Uh, so you have to operate on what you understand as being the best practices for that, for that sort of interaction. Right. Um, there's tons and tons of stuff that goes into skill and strategy, and we'll probably have to do a whole nother episode on it. But uh, just know that one way to give your game more variance is to raise the skill ceiling by adding more choice into your game, more uh, points of decision making. And the thing that you need to be careful of when you do this is that you're not doing it all at once. Right. Uh, the term, the design term is called chunking. At least that's what I call it. That's a graphic design term um, in that you take uh, uh, smaller, you basically cut up the decisions into smaller pieces for your players. Right. Magic does this very well in terms of that they've they have uh, uh different phases of your turn you know that during your you know your untap upkeep draw there's uh you know main phase combat phase these these types of decisions that are being made are being sectioned into different parts of your turn the other thing that it does well is with mana cost i think this right. is one of the reasons mm -hmm. why you know card game design keeps coming back to this is that mana cost does a very good job of chunking your decisions yeah right the 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 choices that it's asking you to make in terms of like okay well this is also one thing that i always complain about when games uh allow you to use any card as mana. i was just gonna bring that up yeah. uh, <laughs> this is the huge down <clears throat> downfall of that is that you now have created another decision point in that okay well this card could be the card that it is or it could be a resource right what which way do i want to do that yeah. i have to now think and use up some mental capacity to decide which card should be played as mana and which card I should play as the card. Suddenly, on a turn one, instead of just having the one card you could play yep. because you have the one mana, now you suddenly have five other possibilities yep. of how you could play your cards and arrange them in different ways. And it's just, it's like if you haven't done this. Just go and play like one thing of Kaijudo or Duel Masters or whatever. <laughs> just grab a hand and then grab a hand of magic cards and just think like, what's your brain doing? Yep. Like analyze that. Yep. Some people love that. More competitive players love it because it's more consistent. Right. They like the choice, right? But as you got to think like from a casual player standpoint, from a new player standpoint, at least, it's a lot. It's very overwhelming. Yeah. Okay. So the next type of uh, variance is opponents. Yes. Uh, we already <laughs> talked about this. Chess uh, is a prime example of this is its only real form of variance is that you're going to play against different people. Those people are going to be different skill levels. They're going to have different ideas of what the best strategy is. Yep. They're going to respond to you in different ways. Uh, this is why uh, a PvP game is almost always more replayable than a PvE game yep. or, or you know, a, a game that has a definite narrative or Even things like that. Even when it is the only 
amount of variance like chess like even when yes. it's technically a a solved game in a way mm -hmm. it's still more interesting when you can go against someone that can you know do things a little differently right and and being able to sort of simulate the the variance that you get from an opponent is very difficult like even the best ai in elden ring uh, uh, you know, it, it still is a boss that you're playing against. You can still sort of memorize and they telegraph yeah. and you can kind of, uh, learn the dance of how you're supposed to fight that boss. Right. right? Versus if you're playing a, a different opponent, it's going to be vast. Like you might be able to memorize that one opponent, but you go through that process each with each new opponent that you face. Right. Um, I think that's about it for opponents. Um, oh, the, oh, right. One more thing. Uh, the number of opponents that you're up against mm. uh, is also something to look at in terms of uh, variance. This can be a right. good or a bad thing. Um, but yeah, uh, playing, you know, a very easy example is, okay, well, you can play two-player magic or you can play commander, which is four-player. Right. And because you have even more opponents, there's even more variance added to the game, right. which is one of the reasons why commander magic is off often viewed as a more casual format. Right. There's a lot of other reasons, but that's probably the main one. I think on top of that, I mean, moving away just from like, <clears throat> moving away from just tabletop board games and card games and stuff for a second too, is like, I think this is also what makes sports so interesting. Yeah. It's because we've had a lot of talks about like, all right, what's that divide between like, you know, luck and skill mm -hmm. in something as close as like football, right? Mm -hmm. When there's like zero luck. Well, there isn't, a, you're losing luck, but you have a lot of variance because the yeah. amount of players all have different physical body types, different physical yep. attributes. They all offer something and specialties, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that variance keeps things very interesting. Right. Even like comparing, like you say, uh, you know, like American football to tennis or something, yep. right? Where uh, there's so much more variance in Amer American football because yep. there's just so many more people on the field. There's a lot more opportunity for different things to happen different yep. scenarios to come up different people to get in the way be where they're supposed to be or not where they're supposed to be they could trip their shoes could be untied their pants yep. could be pulled down who knows yep it's crazy they do a crazy touchdown dance right you never know you never know what's gonna happen yeah variance variance <laughs> all right so the last and maybe least important type of variant. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> random, randomizers. Yes, yeah, randomizers. Uh, yeah, it's so what most games use. Yeah, at least in some capacity. Yeah. Um, not chess. Not chess. Do you know that somebody designed random chess? How's that work? I, I think again, Richard Garfield. Just talks all the pieces. About it. And yeah, the, like... the the arrangement of the pieces at the beginning of the game is randomized. Okay. Yeah. Sounds Weird, interesting. Huh? Yeah. I think it's just the back row, right? It's not the, like, pawns can't be in the oh, back row okay. and stuff. It's just the back row. Anyway, so, uh, you know, card games, it, it's so interesting because it, they're, they're kind of cheating in a way because players accept mm -hmm. the randomness that is in a deck of cards as just being uh inherent to a card game. Like, they're, they're very accepting of, I shuffle this deck and I draw cards from it. And right. so you can get a lot of variance, a lot of, of accepted randomness from players just because you're making a card game. Um, but yeah, if we're talking about random, we can't talk about random without talking about input and output randomness. Somebody has a good talk on randomness in particular, right? Is, is, yes. Uh, uh, Jeff Engelstein gave a GDC talk, I think in like 2014 or 2015 or something, all about randomness. Uh, has a bunch of other stuff, talks about different types of noise frequencies and stuff like that you should go watch it if you're interested but um the simplest forms of randomness they touched on were input and output randomness right. which is what yep. most people think of when they think of randomness because they watched game makers toolkit or something and yeah, right. <laughs> well uh uh he has a podcast too i think Ludo uh, ludology is that him yeah yeah, yeah i think that is him, yeah. okay anyway uh stuff to check out for further research um but yeah so so the simplest uh, way to describe randomness is you have input randomness or you have output randomness. And the way I define those things is input randomness means that the randomness happens before the decision is made and output randomness means it hap that the randomness happens after the decision has been made. Yes. So a key example being I shuffle up my deck of cards, I draw seven, and I get to choose now and make decisions about that, that those seven cards, right? right. The, the deck of cards is the randomness. It happens before I'm making decisions. Uh, output randomness would be rolling dice, right? Okay, I've decided to attack this thing, and I'm rolling an attack roll, right? And I'm gonna see whether I hit or not. In I think D and D. Most people do end up just thinking dice rolls equals output, 
and I mean, it can, it can dice rolls can be input or right. It really or it's else, just but. it's wherever it's placed in right. the results or the action of the player. Um, right. I also think most people end up thinking that output randomness is like bad. Maybe we, oh, this yeah. is a whole other talk yeah, at no, some point no, about like randomness, but there's no good or bad. These right. are tools. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're tools for different types of experiences. And I'd um, say that like it, no matter what, I mean, you mentioned like cards, card games get a pass in a way because like people just accept the way that the cards are randomized and stuff. And I'll say like, I'm, I'm sure there's a way that you can make a card game that someone would not accept the randomness. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> because yeah. the, I mean, like, early, early Hearthstone is a great example. Uh, where you they had cards early on that did like one to three damage or something, and you wouldn't right. know how much damage it was going to do until after you played it. <laughs> right, and I think I, I think it's really it's wherever the randomness is placed in association yeah. with what you're doing, and sometimes it's narratively tied. Sometimes it's just a feeling. Sometimes things just yes. don't feel right for you know whatever reason. Um, and yeah, other times, like I said, it it doesn't line up narratively with what people anticipate this randomness. Uh, being it doesn't yeah. feel right as in associated uh, association with the story. Um, yeah, that's that's variance uh, in a nutshell. Yes, uh, this topic is way broader and deeper than what we have gone into here. Yeah, um, we might have more episodes. Talking yeah, I about think it. we should have more on specific types of randomness, probably uh, or on variance, uh, and not and and how you shouldn't call it randomness, you call it variance. 